There's no going back. You've changed things. Forever. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for some of the most vile, sadistic, and evil villains in fiction. Break me down with all of your hatred, and your journey towards the dark side will be complete. Number 30, The Sheriff of Nottingham. That's it then. Cancel the kitchen scraps for lepers and orphans. No more merciful beheadings. And call off Christmas. The Sheriff of Nottingham serves largely as a representation, and the metaphor is pretty clear. The Sheriff is the main antagonist in the legend of Robin Hood, and as you all know, Robin Hood steals from the rich and gives to the poor. Robin Hood steals money from my pocket, forcing me to hurt the public, and they love him for it? Yes. The Sheriff is the very embodiment of said rich. He is covetous, he is selfish, and he imposes unaffordable taxes on the citizens of Nottinghamshire. He is the very personification of greed and avarice. He's also been portrayed by some true movie legends, perhaps most famously by Alan Rickman in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Robin! Do you mind, Loxley? We've just been married. <coughs> Number 29, The Grand High Witch of All the World. Roald Dahl's 1983 dark fantasy story The Witches was adapted to film twice. In every version of the tale, the Grand High Witch is the queen of the baddies. I, the, I demand maximum results. She rules over a secret cabal of witches hiding among humanity. As their ancient and terrible leader, she's held power through viciousness and fear. These qualities are matched only by her thirst for blood. She's quite literally dubbed, quote, the most evil and appalling woman in the world. So, you know, in both the books and the films, she is portrayed as a terrifying hag. Now I've got you! <laughs> and her goal? She tries to turn every child in the country into a rodent. She figures the parents will take care of the rest. Number 28, Claude Frollo. Claude Frollo is as evil as they come in The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Despite his piety and his rescue of a baby Quasimodo, he is a man with few virtues. And who knows, our Lord works in mysterious ways. Even this foul creature may yet prove one day to be of use to me. In Victor Hugo's book, he is ruled by his lust for Esmeralda. That lust grows into a singular obsession. Somehow, the Disney version of Frollo, the character most of us know and hate, is even worse. This take on the antagonist also emphasizes his bigotry against the Romany. How dare you defy me? You mistreat this poor boy the same way you mistreat my people. You speak of justice, yet you are cruel to those most in need of your help. Silence! Justice! He is driven to eradicate them from the streets of Paris, even as he longs to possess Esmeralda as his own. He manipulates Quasimodo for his own ends, and hides his own sin behind his faith. It's horrid. Number 27, The Borg. The original Star Trek series aired amid the Cold War, and its antagonists reflected the sentiments at the time. The Klingons and Romulans, respectively, came to represent America's geopolitical foes, the warlike Soviet Union and the subtle communist China. When Star Trek The Next Generation aired 20 years later, they needed something new. Interesting, isn't it? Not a he, not a she. Not like anything you've ever seen. An enhanced humanoid. What is it you want? Enter the Borg, a cybernetic race bent on absorbing every other species into a hive mind known as the Collective. For decades across television and film, the Borg have haunted the likes of Captains Jean-Luc Picard and Catherine Janeway. Oh, and all of us. Do what all good pragmatists do. Admiral, compromise. When the main words a group speaks are resistance is futile, you know you're not in friendly company. Number 26, Voss Montenegro. Voss Montenegro is only the secondary bad guy in the 2012 Far Cry 3 game, but you wouldn't know that given how much they featured him in promotional materials. From California, huh? Well, I hope you remind your papa really, really love you, because you two white boys, you look very expensive. And that's good, because I like expensive things. When Michael Mando showed up to audition, 
he decided to wing it. He crushed it, and Ubisoft seemingly knew they had something special on their hands. So they rewrote the character, a criminal with substance use disorder, around the actor. Montenegro is an absolutely off-the-wall monster with a love for violence. In other words, he's a nightmare, and the perfect foil for protagonist Jason Brody. Did I ever tell you the definition of insanity? Oh, Jesus. After all, Voss is who Brody could become if he allows himself to go dark. Nobody wants to confront that version of themselves. Number 25, Lady Macbeth. Before Cersei Lannister, there was Lady Macbeth. Come, you spirits, attend on mortal thoughts. Unsex me here, and fill me from the crown to the toe top full of direst cruelty. Both were noble women using their positions to leverage whatever power they could in a cruel patriarchal system. Things ultimately end poorly for both of them. Similarly to Iago in Othello, Lady Macbeth manipulates behind the scenes. She whispers poison into her husband's ear and sets him on a murderous path. And even though she winds up a tragic figure, she's also something of a monster, even if it's not the traditional kind. After all, the consequences of her actions are brutal and real and wind up affecting her too. In the play's final act, she loses her grip on reality, imagining blood on her hands that won't wash off. Will these hands now be clean? No more of that, my lord. No more of that. Overwhelmed, she takes her own life. Number 24, Mr. Hyde. Despite being introduced way back in 1886, Mr. Hyde is still synonymous with evil. Such is the staying power of a wonderfully written villain. As you probably all know, Edward Hyde represents the evil traits of protagonist Henry Jekyll. Unlike his kind and moral counterpart, Mr. Hyde is completely merciless and is willing to indulge in vices and perform actions that Jekyll is not willing to do, including murder. Damn my sweet. Damn my dove. Damn my little bride. Perhaps the story has remained so relevant due to its topicality and universality. After all, who among us hasn't had to repress sinful or perhaps even violent urges throughout our lives? Jekyll could not resist the temptation, and it completely ruined his life. Now, let that be a lesson to you. There. There he is. There's your man. Number 23, Carnage, Cletus Cassidy. Part red alien symbiote, part murderer Cletus Cassidy, there's no denying that Carnage is one of the most deranged villains in all of Marvel Comics. As a child, Cassidy was a well-established killer before he even learned how to drive. When he becomes the symbiote's first host, Carnage is cemented as a truly unparalleled menace. In the Maximum Carnage storyline of the 1990s, the villain drenches the streets of New York in blood. It doesn't stop there either, also causing destruction in Texas among other places. Carnage's ruthlessness is profound and its powers are nothing short of impressive, an evil and dangerous combination that makes for one of Spider-Man's scariest foes. There you are. Death to you, father. No! Not you, father. You. Number 22, Ganon, Ganondorf. Ganon is much like Shao Kahn. He is massive, he wields some incredible pieces of mystical magic, and he wants nothing more than to rule the world. He originally appeared in an imposing boar-like form before obtaining his signature humanoid appearance in Ocarina of Time. Still imposing, just in a different way. He also serves as the very embodiment of evil, not just because of his awesome stature, dangerous abilities, and the use of the Triforce of Power, but also because he'll use a variety of evil methods to obtain his desires, including political manipulation. Ganon is easily one of gaming's most iconic and most unstoppable villains. <laughs> Number 21, Fire Lord Ozai. Despite originally being the primary antagonist of the show, 
Fire Lord Ozai is a villain with surprising depth for media aimed at children. Oh, that's just beautiful. On the one hand, voice actor Mark Hamill plays him as a straight sadist. He's more than willing to kill and burn in order to exert his will on the world. As the series goes on, however, we understand that Ozai is both a victim and perpetrator of generational trauma. His family was brutal, and his relationship with his father, whom he ultimately killed, speaks volumes. Although he had the opportunity to transcend his past, he instead carried on the cycle of abuse with his own children. Rise and fight, Prince Zuko! I won't fight you. You will learn respect, and suffering will be your teacher. Number 20. Kevin Thompson, Kilgrave, aka Purple Man. Marvel's Jessica Jones introduced Kilgrave, aka the show's take on the Purple Man, into the MCU. Kilgrave is a textbook example of the popular idiom, hurt people, hurt people. Oh, everyone, calm down. You're killing the mood. Jessica. I'm not surprised to see me. You had to know I'd come for you. In the show, we learn that his parents' cruel experiments gave him the ability to control people's minds. Talk about holding a lot of power. And let's just say he doesn't really use it for good, making him a villainous force to be reckoned with. He could destroy free will with a single spoken word, as evidenced by the horrors he inflicts on Jessica Jones and his other victims. You want death by a thousand cuts? Do it. <laughs> what? This is an absolute menace. Number 19, Pennywise, It. Despite a bibliography spanning decades, Pennywise is arguably Stephen King's greatest creation. Where are you going, It? If you lived here, you'd be home by now. Come join the clown, Ed. You'll float down here. Well, float down here. Of course, it serves as the very personification of evil itself, as it takes on whatever form its victim is afraid of most. And it does this because, get this, it makes its victims tastier. <gasps> yeah, it's pretty depraved. And like Freddy Krueger, it has a massive ego and constantly taunts its victims with horrific visuals and cocky asides. <laughs> You want to play loogie? Oh, and let's not forget that it is actually a shapeless and eons old alien that comes from something called the Macroverse. We've got quite literally a little bit of everything here, including some Lovecraftian madness. What's not to love? Number 18, Dark Side. If you take the power and malice of Thanos and add in the Purple Man's mind control ability, you basically get Dark Side one of the worst villains to come out of DC Comics. I will stride across their bones and bask in the glow of anti-life, and all of existence shall be mine. Darkseid is part of an alien race known as the New Gods, immortal and almost invincible. He rules his fiery planet apocalypse without mercy, bending his subjects to his will by any means necessary. But that's not all. He's also in search of the anti-life equation, a power that would essentially allow him to enslave all life after taking away free will. Anti-life is found, Desaad, and we will stop at nothing to possess it. Ready the Armada? We will use the old ways. Because of that quest, he has destroyed countless lives and done so in brutal fashion. Evil barely begins to describe it. Number 17, Scar. If we're going by the the Lion King is just Hamlet for kids argument, which we totally should because it's true, then Scar is the cartoon equivalent of King Claudius. Life's not fair, is it? Only he's a lot worse. Whereas Claudius showed some remorse for his actions, Scar is totally unrepentant. Long live the king. Not only is he conniving, he's also not above killing his own nephew to obtain complete and total control. Run away and never return. K. 
kill him. This guy is cold. Everyone intrinsically hates Scar because we've been living with his misdeeds since childhood. He is a fantastic introduction to the elements of depravity, greed, and total selfishness. And fascism. Children have to learn about it eventually. Number 16, Agent Smith. Agent Smith is a sentient computer program and the principal villain in the Matrix franchise. Smith is essentially the head game warden in the nature preserve called The Matrix. As you can see, we've had our eye on you for some time now, Mr. Anderson. It seems that you've been living two lives. His job is to maintain order and hopefully find a way to destroy the free human city of Zion. But he's also defined by an utter disdain for humanity, and his resentment fuels unforgivable callous behavior. When Neo kills Smith at the end of the first film, he inadvertently frees him from the confines of the Matrix's laws. With his newfound freedom and power, Smith seeks to dominate every person and program on Earth. We're not here because we're free. We're here because we're not free. There's no escaping reason, no denying purpose, because as we both know, without purpose, we would not exist. He threatens all life, both artificial and organic, forcing them to join forces to defeat him. Yikes. Number 15, Jigsaw. Hello, Michael. I want to play a game. It doesn't get much more depraved than the Jigsaw Killer. Unlike most movies of its ilk, the Saw franchise actually personified Jigsaw by giving him a tragic backstory and a legitimate motivation. But that doesn't make him any less sick. Of all the traditional horror movie killers, Jigsaw is easily one of the most psychotic. Not only because he forces his victims to harm and traumatize themselves, if they survive, but because he genuinely believes he's doing good. Those who don't appreciate life do not deserve life. He's not just some mindless and unstoppable killer that walks around in a mask. He's just a man with a really sick and twisted sense of righteousness, not to mention an obscene imagination. Most people are so ungrateful to be alive, but not you, not anymore. Number 14, Hannibal Lecter. People will say we're in love. Hannibal is a highly intelligent man who once worked as a forensic psychiatrist before being imprisoned for, you know, cannibalism. There's something intrinsic and primal about fearing Hannibal Lecter. One look into his emotionless eyes is enough to set off some instinctual warning bells. Pity about poor Catherine, though. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. It's like looking into the eyes of a lion. You just know this thing is gonna overpower you and eat you for dinner without a second thought. Plus, Hannibal often uses his intelligence to his benefit, resulting in his ever-elusive nature. I do wish we could chat longer, but I'm having an old friend for dinner. Bye. It doesn't get much scarier than Hannibal Lecter. Not when it comes to human villains, anyway. Number 13, Homelander. While originally written for the boys' comics, Homelander has evolved into a pop culture icon in the Amazon Prime Video adaptation. Homelander? You boys okay? Can I, can I get a selfie? Of course you can. In a world where most superheroes are also terrible people, Homelander is the worst of the worst. Draped in the stars and stripes, his patriotic facade only serves to mask a self-absorbed sociopathy. He isn't just an evil Superman. Homelander is worse. He's the personification of toxic masculinity at its worst. He's a bigot, a misogynist, and a parody of many politicians today. Sometimes, well, these things just happen. Wait, this happened no. before? How many times? Well, no, hold, hold on, guys. My point is, we all have the same goals, don't we? Unfortunately, he's not channeling some unrealistic, far-fetched villainy. That's scary enough. To make matters even scarier, though, there appears to be a subset of fans who love him unironically. Number 12, Kefka Palazzo. The Final Fantasy video game series is host to a wide variety of villains, ranging from the evil priests, evil mercenaries, and in one case, an evil tree. Yet, after 15 installments and countless spin offs, this maniacal jester from the sixth installment of the series remains the most evil of the lot. Here comes Kefka! Boom! Let's teach them a thing or two, or three! To put it simply, Kefka views all life, 
all culture, hell, all of existence is worthless, a means to fuel his desire for destruction. He'll even betray his own allies without a second thought just because he feels like it. Yet even when he manages to devastate the world and obtain godlike powers, that's still not enough for him. It's not enough. Destroy more. I've got to destroy more. Number 11, Gus Fring. As any loyal Breaking Bad viewer knows, Gus Fring was an almost unstoppable villain. Ruthlessly efficient in running his empire, unafraid to make cuts, if you know what we mean. I don't think we're alike at all, Mr. White. You are not a cautious man at all. Throughout the series, he buried his true calculated self behind the mask of a respectable local business owner, when in reality, the chicken man has a spine of pure steel and is someone that you really do not want to mess with. Fans were over the moon when the drug lord was brought back in season three of Better Call Saul. You can't replicate that kind of evil. Between his savage rivalry with Lalo Salamanca and his countless misdeeds, he is a vile one. Wow. That explains everything. I am glad you are satisfied. Number 10, Freddy Krueger. Please, God. This is God. Despite the campy sequels and his colorful personality, Freddy Krueger is undeniably one of the scariest slashers in movie history. For one thing, there's literally no escaping him. You can't run away, you can't hide, and you can't outthink him. You'll have to sleep eventually, and when you do, Freddy will be waiting. He was a monster in real life as well, as he earned the nickname Springwood Slasher due to his propensity for torture and murder. Hello? I'm your boyfriend now, Nancy. <laughs> his finger knives and horribly burnt face are also literally the stuff of nightmares. To make matters worse, he's also incredibly cocky and isn't above viciously taunting you before he finishes you off. He's a walking smorgasbord of scares. No. You die. Number 9, Nurse Ratchet. The true horror and villainy of Nurse Ratchet isn't just that she's a terrible person, it's also that she's the callous, unfeeling face of a dehumanizing system. Miss Ratchet! Yes, Mr. Cheswick? I asked you a question. I heard your question, Mr. Cheswick. And I will answer your question as soon as you've calmed down. Okay. In One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, patients are boxes to check and sources of income rather than people to genuinely treat. Their humanity is an inconvenience to Nurse Ratchet, and she doesn't care to stop to truly see the individuals in her care. She has ice in her veins and only cares about things going her way in the psychiatric institution. N don't, don't have to t t t tell her, Miss Ratchet. I don't have to tell her. Your mother and I are old friends, you know that. The fact that there are real life nurse ratchets out there in the world makes her all the more horrifying. We see the worst of humanity in her, and it is not pleasant. Number eight, Anton Chigurh. What's the most you ever lost on a coin toss? Sir? The most you ever lost on a coin toss? I don't know, I couldn't say. Cormac McCarthy, the Coen brothers, and of course, Javier Bardem, all helped create one of the greatest villains in recent years. Anton is the primary antagonist of McCarthy's No Country for Old Men and the resulting movie adaptation. And we never thought a guy with that kind of haircut could be so menacing. Like many of McCarthy's villains, Chigurh is more of a walking, talking metaphor than a three-dimensional character. You mean the nature of this conversation? I mean the nature of you. And what Chigurh represents is certainly up to interpretation, although many fans and scholars have debated elements of death, chance, and fate. Is he death himself? Does he represent remorseless fate? Either way, he's a stone cold and emotionless killer, and there is nothing scarier than that. You got no cause to hurt me. No, but I gave my word. You gave your word? To your husband. Number seven, Joffrey Baratheon. Please let me go home. I won't do any treason. I swear I'll Mother just... says I'm still to marry you, so you'll stay here and obey. Game of Thrones was filled with complex and three-dimensional characters, and even the most evil characters weren't portrayed as mustache-twirling cartoon villains. 
aside from Joffrey Baratheon. Well, and Ramsay Bolton. You win the game if you can figure out who I am and why I'm torturing you, and I win the game if you beg me to cut off your finger. But Joffrey takes the cake. He has absolutely zero redeeming qualities, and even his selfish and conniving family thinks he's the worst. Killing you would send your brother a message. <laughs> but my mother insists on keeping you alive. He's a perfect representation of a spoiled child given way too much power. He kills on a whim, and often without thinking of the consequences, treats his citizens and family like dirt, and roots his entertainment in the suffering of others. And to make matters worse, he's a total crybaby. His painful death could not come fast enough. Uh, he's choking! I'm the poor boy! Number 6. Hans Landa Landa is arguably Quentin Tarantino's greatest villain. What are you aware of? Did they call you to join them? Precisely. Not only is he a brilliantly written character, but he's played with awe-inspiring reverence by Christoph Waltz, who went on to win like all of the awards. Landa takes pride in being wicked and feared, egotistically embodying his nickname by using manipulative tactics and a false sense of friendliness to kill Jewish people. Il y avait une autre chose que je voulais vous demander. Mais maintenant, sur ma vie, impossible de m'en souvenir. He's also a complete monster who hides behind his admittedly alluring charm. He is fiercely intelligent and is able to outsmart his enemies at every turn. Even in the end, he's able to worm his way out of trouble, well, mostly, by betraying Hitler and the Nazi party to the inglorious bastards. The smartest villains are always the scariest. Gentlemen, I have no intention of killing Hitler and killing Goebbels and killing Goering and killing Bormann, not to mention winning the war single-handedly for the Allies, only later to find myself standing before a Jewish tribunal. If you want to win the war tonight, we have to make a deal. Number 5. Michael Myers Don't let the everyday name fool you. Michael Myers is not human. I met this six-year-old child with this blank, pale, emotionless face and the blackest eyes. Well, he is, but not really. Michael Myers also goes by The Shape or The Boogeyman, which is perhaps a more apt description. Michael is arguably the most influential slasher in movie history, as his template was used for countless villains throughout the years. All right, all right, come on, where's my beer? Well, can't you answer me? Slow but menacing and unrelenting, totally unkillable, completely emotionless and silent, and seemingly without a shred of humanity. Uh -oh. no. uh -oh. The first Halloween implies that nothing made Michael evil. He was simply born into it. And that is a horrifying summation of humanity. Some people are just empty and soulless, and that is not a comforting thought. Number 4. Sauron Once again we have a villain that represents the very concept of evil itself. Sauron was never meant to be much of a character. He was always meant to serve as a representation of evil, greed, and the fallibility of man. In the land of Mordor, in the fires of Mount Doom, the Dark Lord Sauron forged in secret a master ring to control all others. And into this ring, he poured his cruelty, his malice, and his will to dominate all life. He makes a ring to rule Middle-earth, and most people caught in the ring's vicinity, especially humans, are drawn to and corrupted by its promises of unimaginable power. But even the brief glances of Sauron we do get, like his striking immensity, formidable armor, the fiery eye of Sauron, and his guttural whispers are enough to scare us senseless. You cannot die. I see you. Even in 
scenes not directly involving Sauron or the ring, his oppressive presence and promises of destruction are felt. He is an omnipotent evil incarnate. A great eye, lidless, wreathed in flame. Yeah, I'm sorry. He is gathering all evil to him. Number 3. Voldemort We've all had bad teachers, but none quite like Dolores Umbridge. Students will raise their hands when they speak in my class. However, we're starting to realize that some of the greatest villains are really just analogs of dictators, and that's where he who must not be named comes in. Voldemort is this to the magic world. He unequivocally believes in blood purity, he leads a devout following of violent and prejudiced minions, and he wishes for complete and total control of the magical world. I confess myself disappointed. He also has dark magic on his side, and people are literally afraid to say his name out of fear and traumatic memories of the first Wizarding War. You have to be a special kind of evil for people to fear your very name. A few years ago, there was one wizard that went as bad as you can go, and his name was... V his name was... V Maybe she wrote it down. No, I can't spell it. All right. Voldemort. Like Sauron, the threat of Voldemort hangs over the early novels, even when Voldemort himself is incapacitated. He is universally feared, and his evil presence is unrelenting. Number 2. The Joker The Joker is easily one of the most prolific villains in modern history. I'm a man of my word. <laughs> <laughs> Joker is an OG Batman villain, having first appeared in the debut issue of Batman in 1940. Since then, he and his psychotic ways have popped up in animation, video games, movies, TV shows, you name it. Give me one reason why I shouldn't have my boy here pull your head off. How about a magic trick? Joker is one of the most enticing villains not because he's fun and novel, although he certainly is that, but because he's cunning, manipulative, and intelligent. I wanted to see what you'd do. And you didn't disappoint. You let five people die. Then you let Dent take your place. Even to a guy like me, that's cold. This is perhaps best displayed in The Dark Knight, when the Joker constantly outsmarts and manipulates everyone and remains one step ahead of his targets. Despite displaying no superhuman characteristics, the Joker remains the most threatening and dangerous villain in comic book history. And that's saying something. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Emperor Sheev Palpatine, aka Darth Sidious Darth Vader certainly is an iconic villain, but he's not the evilest. Where are those transmissions you intercepted? What have you done with those plans? Now, you know, seeing as how he turns good. No, that distinction belongs to Emperor Palpatine. Palpatine doesn't get a lot of screen time in the original trilogy, but he still makes one sinister impression. What is thy bidding, my master? There is a great disturbance in the Force. Most of Palpatine's characterization comes from the supplemental material and prequel trilogy, where we witness his progression from cunning and devious politician to full-blown tyrant. Are you threatening me, Master Jedi? The Senate will decide your fate. I am the Senate. He proceeded to reign over the most tyrannical and abusive regime in history, and became the very embodiment of evil within the Star Wars Skywalker saga. Did our vile machinations keep your favorite villain off our list? Let us know in the comments below. I can't when a problem comes along, you must zip it. Zip it good. Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from WatchMojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.